I'm the director and producer of Nepal Saran, a feature documentary that's showing uh, as part of the festival. So Nepal Saran is five years of work, um, and it really stems from just personal curiosity about this uh, story. It became a myth of uh, solidarity for Chile in the 70s and 80s, um, and which I heard through uh, solidarity nights that I used to go to because my father was an exile from Chile. Um, and it's, it, all we heard about was, was a Scottish boycott of Chilean jet engines. Uh, where the workers refused to work on, on these engines and would put them outside the factory to let them rust over time. And it connected back then because these engines are connected to planes and those planes are part of the most iconic image of the military coup in Chile on the 11th of September 1973, where uh, two planes flew very low over Santiago and fired rockets into the presidential palace where the elected president, Salvador Allende, was refusing to surrender. Um, so these images by then were caught by documentary makers at the time, they traveled the world, and for many Chileans, they really became the irreversible moment of the coup, um, where they felt that nothing could be done against, against such a such such force. Um, so, but so the idea that this powerful image had been given more context and maybe bent a little bit by Scottish workers on the other side of the world, that stuck with me uh, through the years, even though I started disbelieving in the story because, you know, some stories sometimes are too good to be true. Um, so this, this was the beginning of, of five years of research and filming um, into finding the guys who were involved in the action, but more importantly, finding what was the real impact behind the Solidarity. When I was a kid, we used to go to Solidarity Nights, and I remember in Scotland, they always mention the hawker hunters stuck in a factory because of a worker's action. The idea to me that somebody had managed to defeat those planes, that was incredible. I just want to know what's true. You know, looking back, it's interesting how unprepared we were for this project because we never really expected how much uh, we were going to find and all these connections we'd make between the UK and Chile and Scotland and Chile. Um, you know, when you see the film, these guys at the, at the beginning, they're, they're telling us a joke that they played on a dictatorship 45 years ago. They're very proud of it, but they don't really expect anything to have come out of it. Um, and so we never really expected how much, I wouldn't say we wrote history, but how much history we would have to recover to build that story together and convincingly, not just retell for an audience, but convincingly tell back to the guys so they would end up accepting the role they played historically um, after so much time. We've used various techniques to tell that story. Obviously the guys are quite old, so it was really hard to get them out of their flat, out of their couch. Um, so we used uh, animation to recreate, uh, you know, these two key locations, two key moments of time in the story. One is the uh, the boycotts and the mysterious disappearance of these engines after four years of boycotts, and the other is, of course, the attack on the presidential palace. So um, we use animation uh, to recreate those moments because it was really important to create a sense of space and time. Um, the factory was destroyed while we were making the film. Um, so it was, you know, as part of this effort to make this as tangible and as documented as possible, uh, we ended up um, doing very, uh, almost kind of photorealistic recreation of the factory in the palace. And then there was, uh, which was absolutely fascinating for me, there was a huge work on archival footage um, from from UK, from the US, and from Chilean sources, and even some from personal footage from uh, from like from the workers to really try to tell that story as visually as possible. Um, and what else can I tell you about that? Yeah, so it's about about two years of footage, not just to. Um, yeah, one of the things we're proudest of is actually a lot of, uh, you know, as we say, the story wasn't, really wasn't well known until we've made this film, but there was footage that existed, because uh, it was a sort of a minor co-celebre back in the day, so BBC would go and film and we, you know, um, the factory and the workers, but because it never become significant, 
it was never digitalized. So as part of the process, there's some bits of archive that we're showing for the first time, and that been, you know, without the project would have been lost in some archive somewhere. My father was a Chilean journalist, uh, exiled in Belgium. So this, even though I was born after it, the story of the coup has, you know, uh, permeated my entire my entire life, and left me from an early age with many questions. Um, so personally, it was it was incredibly. Um, emotional experience to be able to be in the same room with so many people who had heard about for so long, so many people who had been, uh, you know, historic witnesses who had been in the palace while it was bombed. Um, and it was fascinating to be part of that story and be able to connect them all. And, you know, and using the story of the workers to just kind of breathe new life, almost like giving them a new perspective. Because uh, obviously the, the, the Scottish worker carried their, kind of their mischief and their sense of humor. It's quite an unusual perspective on, on, well, on stories of the dictatorship in Chile. Um, so, yeah, no, on a personal level, it was, it was quite a journey to just almost, I had to come to terms with before deciding exactly which way the film was going to go. Um, and maybe in some ways it's good that the film took so long to make because I was able to basically complete my own journey before making probably better professional decisions for the film itself, yes. Part of making the film was not just tell the story, but to make these four guys accept what a role they played uh, in, in that history and the connection they had with, you know, with this country on the other side of the world. Um, and so they, they needed quite a strong uh, trust between us. And I remember kind of early on in the research, when we're starting to find new things, some of the relatives would call me up and say, like, what exactly are you working on? Because there's something different about my grandfather or my father. Um, because I think part of the process to tell the story and accept it, I suppose we all had to be very open with each other, uh, which is, you know, maybe if you're an old man from the left in Scotland, working class, it's not something that comes naturally. Um, so part of the process was going to be able to look back and kind of peel back some emotional layers. Um, you know, one of the things I remember that had a huge impact for them straight away was when we started cutting the Chilean sequences together and they could see how the Chileans talked about their own story and then affecting very much. And then Stuart Barry, who's kind of the narrator uh, of, of, the, the, of the feature film, said he was absolutely moved by this because this um, being emotionally articulate is not something that comes naturally to them. But they could see what, I suppose, the impact it was having on others and how much it deepens the story and how much it deepened the impact of somebody was listening to. So, um, so yeah, we started working with this. And in particular, there's, you know, there's one sequence in the film um, where they get recognition from the Chilean government where when I knew this was happening, we started planning it in secrets with their family all around it because emotionally for them, it was like the final, uh, the final nail in the coffin. There was nowhere to hide in that moment for them. Uh, you know, it wasn't just, I think it was the moment they realized I wasn't making anything up. Uh, they were getting straight from a, an official government, Chilean government representative about what their action had mattered, why it was still relevant today, and why they deserve such a recognition. So all their reaction in the film is just off the cuff, it's just spontaneous. They're literally understanding what's happening as, as you're watching that film, and that's when the penny dropped for them, and it's quite a, uh, a strong, I mean, it, I mean, it's one of the happiest days of my life. But I've noticed that all the interviews we did afterwards were completely difference, much more deeper on a much more uh, personal level. So obviously we've been in touch quite regularly over the project of film and it's been quite a few things that have happened since. Um, but so now we're at the stage where it was interesting because in the first few years they were like, oh, what, what now? What more do you want to do? And now we're at the stage now and everything is actually over. That, um, I think they realize what we've built together. And so now I'm friends with their family. Robert Somerville calls me his adopted Scottish son. So now we actually plan, you know, Christmas dinners and 
Uh, we're not bringing cameras anymore, but we just have a just a regular relationship. Yeah. The film was incredibly hard to make and fund because I think for a long time many people did not think there was much of a story to tell. So, uh, so it was quite a shock when the film came out, and to see how quickly it was embraced uh, by people, particularly in Scotland, it's become the uh, most successful Scottish documentary of all time, which is not a high bar, but we've got it. Um, and it won the BAFTA for Best Film, which is the first time uh, a Scottish document, well, documentary won uh, in the Best Film category. Um, and I think it, it resonated quickly with a lot of people. Obviously, it's about civil disobedience and it's about you know personal self personal self determination and personal political responsibility. Um, in a way that I think people sometimes seem quite detached from politics, and so Bob Fulton uh, became has become quite a figurehead for a lot of people. And there's a bit of hashtag Be Like Bob has been quite popular. Nepa Salan's quite a popular uh, uh, expression now. Many uh, demonstration marches for. Uh, usually to do with um, injustice or equality or human rights, um, which is something we never expect, but we're, we're totally uh, very happy with. Yeah.